Hey everyone, welcome to Wolfbane's Gaming Den. Uh, today we have a rather unique uh, review uh, for you guys. I'll be reviewing the game Arkham Noir. Uh, Arkham Noir, uh, and the version that I have here, I'll just quickly uh, clarify, uh, is the first in a multi-part series from what I understand. Uh, this one uh, is, uh, I believe the name is in here somewhere, the Witch Cult Murders, and I believe this is the first case. I've definitely seen uh, entries for a second case on BGG, and there might be others coming further down the road as well. Uh, but for the purposes of this review, we'll be focusing on this one, looking at the mechanics and the rules uh, in terms of how this specific version slash case uh, plays out. Uh, and I'll share my thoughts on it very quickly. This is obviously the first solo game review that I'm doing on this channel. Uh, hopefully there's going to be a few more of these coming up in the near future. I'm not a huge solo player by any means, uh, but uh, uh, it is definitely something that intrigued me in terms of the theme, in terms of uh, the mechanics, because it is heavily card driven. Uh, and I wanted to try it out, and I was able to give it a, a go a while back, played it a few times, uh, and I have my share, uh, thoughts to share uh, with you guys. So. Uh, let's first go to the table, uh, let's have a look at how the game plays, and then we'll come back and I'll share my thoughts on this uh, as well as the fan rating. So let's find out how this thing works. Welcome to the table everyone. So here obviously we have the game set up for a solo playthrough. Uh, I'll quickly go through what the setup looks like uh, and how you would go through the setup and then we'll go into the rules itself. Uh, there are different uh, rules, summary cards, that you are, uh, reference cards that you will separate out and you will keep it. Um, I'll just have these facing the camera for ease. There are uh, four reference cards that the game comes with and they're called reference cards, but really they're sort of like marker cards that you will mark different areas of the game board with. Uh, you will take these out and you will put it on their described areas. So the ones with the big picture and the case closed uh, is placed over here. The ones with the leads and the discard stack is placed over here. The ones with the stability penalty and the time penalty is placed over here. And the one with the draw stack and then the victim cards is placed over here. Uh, you will shuffle up the victim cards, which are denoted by the victim card uh, name at the back of it. Uh, you will discard one randomly. That goes out. Of, that card will go out of the game. And then you will uh, put all the remaining in a draw pile over here. You will draw two of them and put it down face up on this particular side. Uh, next, you will take all the different clue cards that the game comes with and give it a shuffle. Uh, put it in the draw pile over here. You will lay out five different clue cards on this uh, play area like so. And you will uh, give yourself three different cards uh, in your hand that you would uh, be working with. Over here, we are uh, assuming that we are a couple of few different moves into the game itself. That's why you see these three cards laid out here. But when you're starting the game, uh, obviously there's gonna be no cards on this particular side. It's gonna be blank. And then there is a professional contact card. Uh, you will just uh, take it, put it to the side. It gives you a one-off ability that can be used over the course of the game should you choose to do so. So we'll have these onto the side right over here. Uh, and with that, you're ready to start. Uh, in this game, thematically what's happening is there are murders that need to be solved, as the name of the game will suggest. Uh, you have the witch called murders and you're you have the victims laid out over here, and you're trying to solve crime for those victims over the course of the game. Uh, on your turn, you will do one out of five different possible actions, and then you will move on to a maintenance phase, uh, the actions usually will denote around uh, uh, the leads card that's uh, that right over here. So let's quickly go through what those look like. So as I mentioned, you have a hand size of three and you will start off with three different cards. So the first action that you can do on your turn is you can draw the card from the very uh, left hand side of that area and you can take it in your hand. Uh, and after you do that, uh, basically the cards will uh, shuffle over during the maintenance phase, but we'll come to that later on. But you're taking the card, taking it in your hand. Uh, if you go above your hand limit, you can choose to discard any one of the cards from your hand and it will go to either the discard area or the time penalty area. That is determined by if when you're discarding the card, there's an hourglass symbol at the bottom right hand side over here, uh, the card that is getting discarded has it, then it needs to go to the time penalty area. And you usually want to avoid that as much as possible. But if it does not have that, then it will go to the discard stack right over here. And cards that go to the discard stack uh, usually do not give you a penalty. They can come back at a later stage. So that's your first action. You're basically taking a card from your hand. And then if you need to discard down, you need to follow the discard rules that we just went through. The next action that you can do over here is you can play the very left hand side clue card onto one of the clues. Uh, what you're doing when you look at that, so let's say for example, if you're looking at the very first victim card right over here, and if, this is true for the clue cards as well, you will see that there are icons 
at the right hand side of these cards. So whenever you play clue cards from here onto one of these, so you know there are a certain number of clue cards that have already been placed. So in this particular case, you're looking to match up with these different icons. So there's a magnifying glass and there's an eye symbol right over here. So any card that you play on this side must have at least one of these icons to its left. So if you're playing something like this that says any, obviously it's a wild, so you can put it down next to any card right over here. But if I wanted to match it up to a symbol, I might be able to do uh, this one. Obviously, this is not available because you can only do it with this particular card right over here. But let's say if this was like so, you could take this card and you can play it down here because these symbols now match. Now this will open up a new symbol on its right hand side and then the next card you want to play on this uh, must obviously match up to this. You can choose to play a card to any one of the open cases that you have right up here. It does not have to go to the very first one. It could go to any one of the open ones right there. Uh, so that's the second action that you can do. You take this and you play it on that particular area. When you play the card, a few other things will also happen. You will see that these cards often will have uh, symbols at the very bottom right hand, uh, at the very bottom right over here. Symbols are either in dark black or light brown. If it's a black symbol, it's a mandatory action that you would have to carry out. So something like this says discard a card from this row. Something like this says do a sanity check. You have to do those. The ones that are in brown are optional. Uh, you, may, you may choose to do it or you may choose to ignore it if you want. All the actions are denoted out here uh, so you can read it and it makes automatic sense. I'll quickly call out what the sanity check uh, or the stability check looks like. So whenever you're doing a stability check, you will draw the very topmost card from over here and you will see whether there is uh, one of these symbols on its right hand side or not. So in this case, uh, there is one uh, and then you would basically meet that stability penalty condition and you would put it right over here. If it does not, then it goes to the discard stat, right? Like so. So you're basically doing a stability check uh, whenever you have to meet the condition for one of these cards. The other thing you want to keep an eye out for as you're playing cards down here are the symbols right over here. There are six different uh, clue symbols in the game. Uh, so whenever you're playing a card, you may be introducing a new one right over here. To solve the case, you need to have at least five different kind of symbols in this particular row. So you want to have variety with these as you're playing it down. Uh, whenever you play a cards, there may also be a condition at the top left hand side. So this one says there must be at least three cards played right before it, which you know we have right over here, and hence we were able to play this one down right over here. Uh, others may have a key symbol. Uh, this is not a condition by itself, but it allows you to meet other conditions. Uh, you may, on a future turn, look to play down a card that has a lock symbol on it. Uh, you can only play a lock symbol if you already have another key symbol in that particular row. And for each lock symbol you're playing down, you must have a key symbol in that row already. So it must match up to these. If I wanted to play another lock symbol right over here, I must have a second key symbol that I need to use to play down here as well. So you're putting down cards on your sort of like play area when you're doing that uh, on that turn. The next action that you can do is you can discard this very top post card and then uh, and maybe we'll shuffle these, uh, move these over because another card would have been played. You can discard this very top one and you can solve the case. The way you would solve the case is you must have five unique symbols five unique symbols, not the same symbol repeated does not count, uh, over here. So when you have that, you can technically then solve that case. Uh, the way that it would work is you would you know, take all the cards, put it over here under closed cases. Uh, any cards that you have in this row that have uh, something like this, a puzzle symbol, can be used to put down under big picture. But you can only do so if you have multiple of this particular icon. So in this case, this icon repeats twice. So if I were to take, you know, and we will assume that let's say there's not enough cards here, but uh, assuming we had enough cards here to solve that particular case, uh, we could take this, put it under big picture here to meet that icon and the remaining ones would basically go under uh, this particular row right over here. And that's how you would solve the case and you would contribute towards the big picture symbol. And this is really what you need to win the game. A standard game requires five, whereas an uh, advanced or more difficult game would require six of those. Uh, and I'll quickly mention, anytime you play you know, more than seven cards in a particular row, th uh, thematically the case has gone on for quite a while and you would be penalized by sort of like, you know, having time penalties, uh, sorry, uh, stability checks happening for each and every single extra clue that's played uh, on that particular row. So you want to play out cards as fast as you can uh, with as minimal payout uh, on these as possible. The last action that you can do is you can just discard this very uh, leftmost clue card and then pass. Uh, obviously, it's uh, somewhat of a weaker action, but there might be times when uh, it makes sense to do it. And again, anytime you're discarding a card from here, you will do your check for the discard, which is the timer symbol 
that we had spoken about. So that's there. Uh, and that's pretty much the different actions you can do. Uh, once you're done with your main action, you're moving on to the maintenance phase where you'll check and see whether you've won the game or you've lost the game. Uh, the standard game, as I said, requires five big picture cards right over here. So at that point, if you will check and if you have uh, at least five big picture cards right over here, you've won the game or an advanced game, six big uh, picture cards. Uh, if that condition is not met, you will go on and check the stability penalty area, which is right over here. And if you have five or more cards in this particular area, you've lost the game automatically. You will check the time penalty area. If you have five or more cards over here, a new victim card needs to be drawn out and you will put it down there. Uh, and then once you're done with those checks for you know the win condition and your loss condition, uh, you will then refill this row. So this happens at the very end of the uh, at the very end of your turn. Uh, you will refill this and then you move on to your next turn. And the game continues on and on until you've solved enough cases that has given you enough big picture cards so that you can claim victory or you have uh, way too many stability uh, penalty points right over here and you would have lost the game at that point. Uh, that's pretty much it for the rules. Uh, and let's quickly go back to the table. I'll talk about the things that I liked and didn't like about the game uh, and my family rating on it. All right, so welcome back, folks. Uh, those were pretty much the rules for the game itself. Uh, as you can see, the game is not that heavy. Uh, it is card driven. Uh, so you're playing cards basically on your turn and you're trying to make the most effective use of the clue cards to solve the case with the least amount of cards you could have played on it because there are certain penalties associated with spending too much time solving a case and so on and so forth. Uh, I'll quickly go through a few different items before I talk about sort of like my uh, thoughts on the game uh, gameplay itself. So firstly, production quality, uh, which is the one that I usually start off with when I look at these review videos. It is a card driven game. So basically the components that you have in the game are cards uh, and then the rule book itself. So oops. That's, that's pretty much all you have in the box. Uh, it is a fairly neat, compact uh, uh, design and setup. The card quality is decent. It's uh, not the greatest in the world, but it's good. It, uh, given the fact that it is a card driven game, you'll be shuffling it somewhat uh, over the course of the game and over multiple playthroughs. Uh, but obviously you're moving cards around quite a bit and you know putting things on and off and so on and so forth. So you want the stock quality to be decent enough to withstand multiple playthroughs. And I think these are gonna get through more or less fine uh, with, uh, with most of the games. Although I do wish it might have been a little bit thicker, but it's 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 decent. It's uh, uh, nothing much to complain about there. What I probably like most, uh, as far as the production quality of the game goes, is the artwork. Now it is it is unique. Uh, you will see that the artwork on most of these cards, or all of these cards rather, are in black and white, uh, and it evokes sort of like you know images of that area. It looks like you know something that's a little bit more hand drawn. Uh, it gives it a nice visual flair. Excuse me. That is different from a lot of these other games that sort of like pop up. Uh, a lot of games nowadays obviously have excellent artwork, design, and so on that go on in there. Uh, but it's always nice to see something that stands out in and by itself. And it would have been very easy for this to be, you know, bright and colorful, but have the art be a little bit more uh, macabre and dark with, you know, blood and whatnot. And that would, I would assume, put off some players. Uh, 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 here and there, uh, whereas if you have something like this, it tones that down quite a bit. It gives you that sense of, uh, uh, you know, something's off or, you know, that sense of dread without going overly violent or sort of like evoking a lot of that. So I, I like the artwork in this one. It's definitely a big plus point for me. There is a lot of icons in the game as well. So that's another to keep uh, um, uh, track of. And I'll talk a little bit more about the icons a little bit later, but they are laid out in a way here that it's easy to make out and distinguish. Uh, you know, you have icons at the top, you have icons at the top right, you have icons at the bottom, then bottom right, you have icons right over here, it's just icons all over the place. But they, once you know how the game works, it's very easy for you to look at the exact spot you need to look at uh, to see, you know, if a certain check has worked or not. And it's, it's, it's it becomes fairly easy and intuitive at that point. So, you know, I, I like the work that's gone into the design and layout of the cards as well. Uh, so that's generally at the rule book itself. It's, uh, so uh, let me pull this out. It is just one large sheet. Obviously it's small font and so on. So there's a little bit of stuff to get through, uh, but it, it's, it's, it's not that bad. And it, it works given the complexity of the game. Uh, what I have preferred is small regular book, maybe, but it's, it's not a big deal. It's a, uh, works just as fine as far as I'm concerned. Uh, and other than that, uh, that's pretty much sort of like what you get in the box. 
Now, what do I think about the game? Uh, I like the Lovecraft team generally. So let me, I'll, I'll start off by you know, giving that disclaimer right up, uh, up front. Like I said, I don't play a lot of solo games, but one of the reasons that sort of like I was attracted to this one was because the Lovecraft team is there. Uh, it gives you a nice visual art style. You know, it's something that you can play fairly quickly in about 30 minutes or so. Uh, it, it gave me all the different components to say, you might not play solo, but you know, it has the stuff you're interested in. So give it a go, and and I did. And generally, for the most part, I think it works. I'm glad I tried it out. Uh, so keep a you know love of Lovecraft uh, uh, at the back of your mind as we go through the review. Uh, so that's there. Uh, what do I think about the gameplay itself? Uh, there's a lot to like here generally. Uh, although I do have a couple of some like caveats, things I wish were done slightly differently, and I'll get to that in a minute. But generally. There's it, a lot of what you're doing makes quite a bit of thematic sense, and that was one of the key things that, that I was looking to get out of this game, and I'm glad that it's there. Uh, if you look at things such as a case takes on, you know, too long, and you know, there's time penalty associated with that, that makes sense. It makes thematic sense. Uh, you're putting a lot of strain on yourself, uh, you know, and then you're doing stability checks to make sure that you know you're still all right or not. Again, makes thematic sense. Uh, you're looking to solve different cases. Uh, you start off with the victim and then you find certain clues that lead you to you know further clues and then that leads to more clues again makes thematic sense uh one thing that i wish was there was that you know hopefully there was some flavor text with uh, a lot of these clue cards so you know if you have a like a knife or a book uh there might be some flavor text that just tells you that you discovered this book that gave you this and so on and would have been that nice icing on the cake as far as theme is concerned but again it's not there uh, it, it is fine. Usually most of the time you're just playing this down to go through the mechanics of the game to get to your final win objective. Uh, so I, I don't see that as a big negative, but I wish it had been there. I think that would have been a nice touch uh, to have in. Uh, but generally, again, continue with that idea of team. Uh, if you wait too long to solve these crimes, there's going to be new victims that come out of this victim stack over here. Uh, so that definitely makes sense. Uh, one thing I might have forgotten to mention of the rules walkthrough, anytime you need to draw a victim card, and there is none to draw, you lose at that point as well. So like any solo game, there is more than one way to basically lose uh, as it were. But again, uh, I like that. So like there's a bit of balance to that as well, because intuitively you might feel like if there's a lot of victim cards out there, a lot of open cases, that might be a bad thing. Uh, and it could be, but it also gives you certain advantages that you otherwise may not have had. Uh, for example, there are more different symbols you can now match up to at that point. So you can play more blue cards onto the different cases uh, and hopefully have that work out. So again, thematically it makes sense. If you have more cases that are open, uh, maybe you have a better chance of coming up across a clue that would match up to any one of the different cases you have open. So it makes sense. Uh, so having fewer cases open from that point of view might intuitively feel like, well, that's good because I'm making good progress. I'm closing those cases, so a few things open. But then again, you will have a bunch of blue cards that come along that really do not align to the you know case that you have open. So not, maybe not always a good thing at that point because then you have to discard cards and then you have to look at the penalties associated with the discarding cards and again when you talk about the mechanic of discarding a card you're checking for that hourglass symbol to you know uh, put it in the time penalty area or put it on the discard pile again it's thematic because what it means is you've gone through a clue that hasn't given you anything but more time has passed at that point uh, I like it I, I like how a lot of these mechanics in this game sort of like die into the theme of the game itself and the theme of you solving a murder uh, and so on. Uh, the only two things that I would say, you know, I wish if it were there, it would have really elevated this for me is again, that flavor text that I you know, spoke about. So if the each of the individual cards sort of like told its own story with the image or the icon that you have in there. So, you know, like uh, with this blue card, for example, uh, this looks like some sort of a, a stone edifice or something of like that sort. Like, what's the story there? What's happening? Some flavor text that just tells you would have just really added uh, quite a bit to that ambiance of the, uh, or the atmosphere. Uh, and then secondly, uh, there is no broader narrative in the game. So it's not like there's a story that's sort of like, you know, driving you forward and so on. Uh, but again, I can see that's the one thing that I probably understand as to why it's not there, because obviously if you have it as a narrative driven experience once you play through it once you've probably discovered whatever is there to discover in the game 
and the replay value gets hampered at that point. So I can understand why that's not there, but it would have been a fun thing to have uh, it added on. And I'm curious to see if uh, the future versions of this actually have that in there or not. Uh, so that's there. Uh, now, things that I wish were different uh, or done different in the game. Now, uh, as I said, there's a lot of icons in the game. Uh, and while the game does give you sort of like these handy uh, reference sheets, uh, uh, the first time that you play, or maybe even the first couple of times, you will see or you know you'll find yourself referring to these more than once in terms of the actions of the cards when you play them down. Oh, what does this one do, and what does that one do, and so on and so forth. So you, you'll see yourself doing that quite a bit uh, because there's a lot of icons to keep track of. You know, if there's an hourglass when you're discarding a card, put this here. Do you need to do a stability check when something you know happens or something's triggered, uh, and you may forget. Uh, uh, to do that at that particular point in time. Uh, it happened to me in my first playthrough where I was like, oh, I should have been doing stability checks in the last couple of turns and I haven't. Uh, and obviously, do you then go back and redo it? But then again, the distribution of this card is now different. Uh, so expect that for the first couple of games. But once once you get the hang of it, it, it flows smoothly. It's easy to play. There's a, not a lot of very different kind of cards. Uh, in here, once you know sort of like how to sort of like set it up with the different types together, uh, set up and take down is going to be a bit of a breeze uh, and easy from that point of view. And the icons do get easier with multiple playthroughs, uh, but you would need, you know, for there to be multiple playthroughs for you to get value out of that or make uh, the game a little bit more intuitive and play a little bit faster. Uh, other than that, there's a few different things uh, just in terms of how some of this layout works, which I found a little bit weird. Like, for example, these are called reference cards. Uh, well, I mean, I've, I, I, I've played board games for a while, so these are reference cards, which mark out different sections of the board, then what are these? You know, uh, this gives you the rule summary, this tells you the distribution of the different icons, this tells you the explanation of the icons themselves. Aren't these the reference cards? I, the first time I read it, I honestly was a little bit confused because I was reading the text instead of looking at the images on uh, uh, the rule book itself, and it says put down the reference cards in these sections, and I'm like, why am I putting these down that sort of a distribution and, and in those different spots? And uh, it took me a couple of rereads to realize, no, they're actually talking about these cards uh, right over there. Uh, a few other things that could have been done a little bit differently. You obviously have these are double sided. Uh, this is the standard version. This is meant to be the advanced version. And the way that you're supposed to tell them apart is uh, the game will have a reference card with a number written at some part of the card itself. Uh, if it does not have an asterisk, it's standard. If it has an asterisk, uh, it's the advanced one. And quite often, again, if you don't know where to look, it can be a bit difficult because in this one, the reference card is written right up here. In this card, the reference thing is written right at the very bottom. Why are they not in the same place? Again, it feels like uh, I might be nitpicking a little bit, uh, but the first time I played it, I was looking at these because I knew that I, there were four different reference cards that are numbered one, two, three, and four. Uh, and I couldn't figure out where, you know, is this one number two or three because I can't see it. And obviously, you, you know, you're looking at this thing where you think it's at the very top because I saw that on the other card and I don't see it here. It's just a small thing that's easy to avoid uh, that I wish were done a little bit differently. Uh, other than that, uh, in, I cannot speak a lot to the balancing of the game because a lot of it will depend on uh, the distribution of the cards that come out. I will talk about the difficulty levels. Uh, it is good that the game comes with uh, uh, different difficulty settings that you can use to customize it you know, for yourself. Uh, and of course, you can have different difficulty levels that you can make up for yourself as you're playing the game as well. So it doesn't just have to be that. You can uh, uh, house rule it for yourself. And you know, if you want something that's fast and easy, or if you're teaching a non-gamer how to get through it, you can maybe make it a little bit more easier just so that they get the sense, uh, sense of it. Um, or you can make it a little bit more harder if you really think it's much of a challenge. But uh, six is difficult enough as is, so I would not. I I, I don't think that that's an easy one to me uh, quite as easily. You will usually sort of like you know uh, with the five you have a fair shot of making it through. Uh, with six it becomes a little bit trickier. All of your cases really need to go well uh, for you to do that. And that to me says that the game is fairly well balanced as is. Uh, but that's just based on my experience with the few playthroughs that I've had. Uh, and if at this point I have not discovered any major balancing issues, I don't think it's there. So keep that in mind 
but I just wanted to make sure that I laid out the caveat uh, there uh, for you to consider. Other than that, it's I, I like it. It's uh, I don't think there's enough in here for me to become like a full-time solo gamer, uh, but I've played a few games you know, that are designed to work well solo before. Uh, uh, I played the game solo quite a bit. It's not a solo only game, but it works well enough as a solo game that I, uh, it's a, you know, card driven game that you can uh, uh, play by yourself. Uh, and, but this one is solo only. So, you know, you're playing it by yourself. Could you add a second person to it and play it with them? Sure, but it honestly doesn't add anything to the game. Uh, sharing a decision with a second person, I does not, I, I don't think it would help a game like this. So this is a game that really works well as a solo. Uh, the solo aspect of it is not tacked on. It, it makes sense in the context of what you're doing right over here. Uh, but generally, I again, uh, not a lot for me to comment on beyond that. I, I like it. Uh, I would recommend it if you're a solo gamer. Uh, but how do I put it? Uh, so the Lovecraft theme obviously is one that's done to death in board gaming, right? So if you're one of the people who think this is, you know, one Lovecraft game too many. Uh, this might not be for you. Uh, but even in that case, I would say it's worth considering. Uh, you know, I've gone through the rules explanation, so at least have a look at it. Look past the theme in that case uh, and see if the mechanics work for you or not. Uh, and it doesn't have to be Lovecraft because, you know, there is no great Elder One in this particular case. There is no uh, uh, Cthulhu or any anything like that that's coming up. Uh, it adds to the ambiance and the background and the narrative of it. You know, you have the witch called murders and so on. So obviously it's a Lovecraftian, perhaps, is it? I'm not sure, but uh, it's, it's in that same sort of like, you know, it's, it's in that horror genre, as it were. Uh, but look past it, you know, this is not your typical, there's going to be a bunch of Cthulhu and tentacles that are like popping up all over the place. Uh, don't expect that. If you think the Cthulhu theme is done to death, Still give it a try. Think of it just as you solving murders or solving crimes. And I think it works well enough. Uh, it works well enough. Uh, the first playthrough you may have might be a little bit clunky. So again, don't judge it just by the first playthrough, as it were. Uh, hopefully things should get smoother by the time you try it out a second time or a third time. Uh, so if you're giving it a go, then you know, give, it that, give it that fair shot, as it were. Uh, but then once you do, I think it flows quite well. It works quite well. Uh, the back of the box says it plays in roughly about 30 minutes. Uh, first thing, maybe not, uh, but once you know what you're doing, it's, it's, it's a fair estimate of how long it's gonna take. Uh, I like it. It's, it's a very easy, fast game to play. Uh, and once you get past the icons and you become a little bit more familiar with it, it flows quite well, flows smoothly. Uh, can be more tactical than strategic, uh, as I mentioned. Uh, as you're just looking to match up icons and you know play it there, and then you're solving cases with the different two symbols and whatnot, there's no grander strategy that you're following. But in a couple of playthroughs, you'll discover that you know, like I said, uh, number of victims that you might have out uh, in the open, and the number of cases that you have open. Uh, intuitively, it's not always good or bad, depending on what your preconceived notion might be. Uh, but you will discover those with a couple of playthroughs, and then. Uh, is there a lot of discovery that might be coming up after that? Perhaps not. Uh, so if you're looking to play this like multiple times in a week and then week in and week out, uh, you might tire of it fairly easily. Uh, but if you're playing, you know, if you're bringing it out uh, every now and then as a solo experience, as a solitaire experience, it works quite well. I, I recommend it. Uh, again, disclaimer: I I'm into the theme, so. That's always a bonus for me, but I would say that even if you did not like the theme, uh, but maybe just solving a crime or solving a murder thematically appeals to you, give it a go because uh, it's not on the very far edge of what Lovecraft theme usually delivers on, uh, but there's enough mainstream content in here uh, for it to still be worthwhile and for it to still be interesting to you. So give it a go. I recommend it. Uh, for me, this game gets a solid B+. I think it's a wonderful solo, solo state experience. If I'm playing a solo game, this is exactly the kind of game I want to play. Uh, plays fast, plays easy. Highly recommend it. Uh, not much more to add. Uh, that's it for me. It's uh, Arkham Noir by Ludanova. Uh, 
give it a go. It's a game. I'm oh, sorry, I might not have mentioned the designer's name earlier on. I really should. Uh, designed by Yev uh, Dorigny. Hopefully, I'm pronouncing that correctly. If I'm not, I apologize. Uh, but give it a go. Uh, recommend it. If you have any thoughts, comments, suggestions about the video, please feel free to leave them down below. And I'll see you in the next one. Take care.